I'm Charlie Lasuer, and I'm host of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains, and we're going to take you up into those mountains come the fall. But right now, we're going to be telling some of the great stories with people like Larry Hedrick, Hank Sheffer, and some of the legendary people who have actually been up in those mountains. So join us right here for those tales in Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Well, let me tell you why I'm here. We're, we're here because uh, we're talking about the Superstition Mountain is what we're talking about. Uh, there have been people coming out here for years and years and years for different reasons. Um, they're all looking for gold or looking for wealth, looking for treasure, whatever that might be. I came out for much the same reason, but my reason was a little more focused on the history rather than the gold itself. Um, I've never really put too much uh, credence in the gold itself. Uh, I've seen it, I've seen gold from lots of different places. Uh, none of it shiny and pretty out of the ground, as they think. But my story started when I was 14. I was a trumpet player. And I met a fellow by the name of Rafael Mendez, who was the virtuoso. Um, he was the guy. He was the best there was on the planet. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet him and talk to him one time at a concert. And what was interesting was we talked about music for a little bit, but then we started talking about his heritage because I was young. I'd started it. I'd just turned 14. Uh, he had played somewhere around that age. His family became friends with Pancho Villa. They were a musical family. And Pancho Villa um, took a shine to this young cornet player named Rafael. And he became Pancho Villa's bugler. He traveled, the family traveled with him, but then Pancho Villa traveled with him. What we talked about after talking about music and trumpet things was the old days, the gold, the, the people, uh, Pancho Villa, the histories, and we won't go into that because it's, it's quite extensive with all the regimes that Mexico went through. Many of the people that he mentioned came about later on a television show that I saw. The names were Peralta, Gonzalez, uh, of course, Pancho Villa. His gold was, is now supposed to be over in New Mexico. Uh, he, his head was missing, but his body is buried with the gold, wherever that is. But the Peraltas and the Gonzales, now all of a sudden, I come to find out the Peraltas were of, if you will, an aristocracy in Mexico City. Gonzales was actually, Gonzales and Peralta are like Smith and Jones. Uh, they're very prevalent, you find them everywhere. We've got a great analogy for that, but we'll let that go. But at any rate, we now have Pancho Villa raiding um, into the United States, not only in Texas, but also in Arizona. There are, there are stories that his people came across here, supposedly from some pretty reputable sources. There were pictures uh, I saw some of the pictures where they were actually shot is hard to say. When you have a close frame in a picture, you can't tell where it was shot. But supposedly, some of Pancho Villa's people were on this mountain. So anyway, he's raising havoc. There are maps. And one of the fellows who gets a map, lo and behold, is Adolf Ruth. And he gets the, quote, Gonzalez maps. And that's because he is part of a massacre that took place here on the mountain where the Peraltas were supposedly getting gold before uh, the United States took over this property. So now we have the link from me talking to a Mexican trumpet player through Gonzalez, through Adolf Ruth. We're back up to gold. Ruth is looking for gold, whether it's Peralta gold or what later became part of the, let's say, the legendary history of Jacob Walt. 
Jacob Waltz is a guy who gets here in 1810. Um, much of what was going on through what I just told you was through the late 1800s into the early 1900s. We have Adolf Ruth now going up into the mountain in 1931. He is one of the first who winds up dead and he has a bullet hole in his head. He died of natural causes. You get shot in the head, you naturally die. That's just the way that goes. So for me, the intrigue was in, how did all these things come together? What created, why were these things created um, that we call legends? And Jacob Waltz, this, this little old guy who comes over on a boat to get away from all the history that was going on in Germany and the French revolutions and all that. We won't go there. So now we have this guy and I'm wondering, why is he so important? Why is he, why is he the guy that finds all this gold and nobody else has? If it's that prevalent and it's that rich, they said they found $16,000 with a rich gold ore in a candle box under his bed when he died. Now, if we look back at the time and you figure out how much gold was worth when he died in 1891, $16,000 of rich gold ore, not rich gold, rich gold ore, has to be a pile of gold the size of Cincinnati. That's quite a bit, the way I look at it. But be that as it may, he always did have gold. He was seen down on the, in the little borough of uh, Washington, or Washington Street. Uh, he'd go to the bars and he always had a poke of gold. I never believed that he found that gold himself. My thoughts were that he was part of, how can I say it? He, he was part of the scheme to make Arizona become a state. You need to have population in a territory to become a state. California proved it worked with the 49ers. And after that happened with that gold rush and all that, who struck John? It only took them six months to write their constitution and become a state. California was a state. And I, I honestly believe that the politics played a great, great measure in the story of Jacob Waltz. Uh, whether he was a dupe, I don't know. Uh, he could have been a drunk for all I know. He had money. All we know is that supposedly he killed all these people, which nobody knew anything about. They just said he killed all these people. And if I can interject right there, there's been a bugbear there that really bothers me. We have a guy who supposedly kills 27 people that nobody know any, knows anything about. The population of Phoenix was somewhere over 400. You didn't count Mexicans and you didn't count Indians in those days. So he killed 27 people of a population of 450. You can do the math and figure out what that percentage is. That'd be like you going into Mesa with an AK-47 and a box of ammunition and shooting 1,700 people. But nobody knows anything about it. We also, at the same time, we're talking the 1860s to 1880s, late 1880s. At the same time that that was all going on, there was a guy over in Europe who was killing prostitutes he killed six or eight of them, I forget what it was. And we knew everything about Jack the Ripper because we forget that at that time we had telephones, we had newspapers, we had communication. We know about those poor ladies over there who were killed. That's 8,000 miles away. But we don't know anything about these 27 poor souls that supposedly chased Jacob Walt. Thank you for joining us for this edition of 
Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. And join us next time for some more great tales. And remember, we're actually going to be going up there and we're going to be seeing a lot of these places. So stick around. We're just waiting for it to cool down a bit. Right here on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.